Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the United States Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, where we're doing a series of interviews about the challenges facing the Navy, the United States, as well as its allies. And uh, we're talking now to uh, Dr. Tim Schultz, uh, who is an associate professor uh, here, a PhD from, uh, in history from uh, Duke uh, University, where the, the climate is slightly more tropical than it is here in, in sunny, uh, sunny Newport. Uh, I'm just kidding. It's not sunny. It's thoroughly overcast. But uh, um, you are uh, the Associate Dean of Academics here. Uh, you also teach and lecture on um, ethics and military technology. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, we, we live in a time of very dynamic change, technological uh, advancement. Uh, and a number of the folks involved in that transformation, whether it's Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or any one of a number of folks are talking about the ethics of uh, advancing technologies and artificial uh, intelligence. From your standpoint, what are the big ethical issues that whether your policymakers, uh, general officers, uh, sailors on the deck plates need to think about as they think about the ethics of military technology? I think right now we have to understand that our thinking uh, in terms of ethical reasoning, uh, our thinking in terms of law, it tends to lag far behind the rate of technological change. So we th see these advances in technology and CRISPR and genetic engineering or lethal autonomous weapon systems or quantum computing, uh, drone technology, things of that nature. And it's evolving and developing at such a pace, it's hard to keep up our own, what one historian calls our own intellectual mastery of this technology. How do we master it? How do we control it and shape it for our own ends to promote our own objectives and values, uh, keeping in mind that our allies and adversaries also have a, an interest and a vote in this as well. I think our students who will, many of them will become senior leaders and our current senior leaders, they need to learn how to look at this evolving technology, specifically uh, emerging military technology, through different lenses. A utilitarian lens is not good enough anymore. And that, that's the notion of what are the outcomes going to be? What, what outcome do I need to achieve? What's the greatest good and what's the least harm? That's one lens, but it's insufficient. I think you have to look at it through other lenses, another one being sort of this Immanuel Kant kind of lens where you're looking at what is the universally good? What duties and norms must, must we uphold? Another lens is this notion of virtue ethics. This goes way back to Aristotle. What ideal character do we want to manifest as individuals, as organizations, as services, as a nation? And how do we treat our technology, use our technology, shape technological development in that comports with our ideal character? So there are different ways, different ethical lenses of, that we have to use to examine what's being developed and how we might use it. And that's difficult to do. I mean, you have to take a very nuanced and thoughtful approach. We try to instill that in our students here because that thinking will have transfer value as they scale up to greater positions of responsibility. Uh, how, but the, the ethics of, of unmanned weapon systems in particular, yeah. uh, or armed robots, or however you want to discuss it, uh, appear to have been evolving as somebody who's covered this field for a long time. Mm -hmm. At one point, um, you know, military leaders always would point out, there's always a man in the loop in these systems. We are controlling it. The, the drone is not making these autonomous uh, decisions. And now, over time, uh, that appears to have changed, in part because we think our adversaries are looking at the technology fundamentally differently, may not be as constrained as we are. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are we merely intellectually justifying to ourselves something we might not otherwise do or need to do because we may be forced to do it for military reasons? I is that what's driving this intellectual process? Or is it, as we've seen in so many other military systems that we've, or approaches that we've foresworn in the past, um, m merely sort of coming to grips with um, realities that we will be presented with in a few years' time, whether we like it or not? I think the historical record shows that we have a tendency to justify our actions after the fact and to sort of imprint some ethical reasoning on those without thinking ahead about what we might do and not do or, or refrain from doing. Uh, 
it, it's, it's a contest of ideas, really, and those are shaped by the strategic context. One approach is to be the one that establishes the norms up front. What are the norms for the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning and how that might be controlled by humans? What are the norms in terms of where a human should be in the loop or on the loop in an autonomous weapon system? And in my own personal view, and I'm not speaking for the Naval War College or the Navy, uh, th the notion of a man or human in the loop or on the loop, it, it sh I've seen it shift it, it over the past weeks, months, and years. It's a slippery term. Does it mean physically in the loop, physically in the airplane? What level of control are we talking about? And as we improve our machine learning capabilities and those systems, those algorithms, usurp more human control for the sake of efficiency, then how far are we going to step back and still say, well, there's still a human in the loop? At what point will you start to lose control, uh, supervisory control? and lose or, or surrender some of your human agency. It's, it's gray, it's slippery, uh, it's something that requires a lot of thought uh, collectively, uh, not just within our own service, but across services, and not just with our own nation, but with our allies as well. And we see similar things in terms of questions about space technology. Should we weaponize space? How should we use or not use uh, chemical weapons, obviously those have been banned uh, internationally. Uh, do we need to have some sort of international accord that looks at autonomous weapons, AI, things of that nature? That whole area is ripe for exploration at this point. Uh, and you, would s you could also argue that throughout history, right, we said we would never bomb civilians, and yet we became very, very good at World War II at bombing civilians, including mm -hmm. with, with uh, atomic uh, weapons. Mm -hmm. um, Talk to us a little bit about the certification program. You know, you and your colleagues have created an ethics, military technology ethics certification program. Yeah. Talk to us about what your, you know, why was that important, why it was set up, and what you hope to achieve with it. Sure, I collaborated with Dr. Tom Creeley. He's in our College of Leadership and Ethics, and we uh, linked arms with our provost, Dr. Lewis Duncan, to create this program a couple of years ago. It's called the Graduate Certificate Program in Ethics in Emerging Military Technology. And it's opened up for students on a volunteer basis. It's students who want to take their master's level education here to the next level. And they do additional work, they earn additional credits, they take more courses than the average student, and they also write a lengthy professional paper on a topic that is relevant to that nexus between ethics and emerging technology. And we wanted students to think deeply about some of those technologies I mentioned earlier that are just rapidly developing in the biotech world, in the, in the machine intelligence world, in the autonomous weapon systems, the unmanned systems world, all of those things. N nanotechnology. Nanotechnology, well. nanoenergetics, uh, quantum computing. We want students to think deeply about those and the ethical problems that they, that they impose and that emerge from those emerging technologies, because it's not just technology that's emerging, it's new problems with how to deal with it and how to think about it. And they each focus on a project of their choosing, and we think that has transfer value. After they graduate from here, they'll be able to apply those reasoning skills to other non-trivial problems. I'll, I'll mention a couple of, of uh, student projects that are uh, recently completed or ongoing. We've had students write about lethal autonomous weapon systems. I have a student who just finished his project, and he coined this wonderful term, acts of code. We think about acts of God, an act of God is something that humans had no control over. Uh, you know, it's some type of a natural occurrence, you know, a tornado, an earthquake, or something like that. Nobody's liable, nobody's responsible, nobody's at fault. Well, as we get these very complex systems of systems governed by this code, by the self-learning, machine learning code, how do we assign responsibility and liability what human takes responsibility or is held liable? And at some point, you can't point a finger at a person in the loop or on the loop or outside of the loop, and it becomes an act of code, something nobody had control over. And what do we do about that? What do we think about that as a society? Are we willing to accept that reasoning uh, for bad things that might happen uh, that could contradict all of the many possible good things that could happen as we give more uh, power and responsibility to to inorganic uh, capabilities. 
so I, I love the, the fact that he coined and he thought of this term, and I think it might uh, it might catch on. And I hope he writes more. And our goal is for him to publish this paper in a in you know a, a high powered journal. We also had a student who recently presented on the ethics of space weaponization. He went down to a special conference, co-presented with his faculty mentor on the ethics of weaponizing space, and his paper, their co-authored paper, is going to be in a forthcoming Oxford volume. And we have a student dealing right now, examining well, what about privacy, um, privacy issues, and how the younger generation may be more or less willing to surrender many of much of their privacy. What does that mean for military readiness down the road? And you get into these sort of sticky ethical issues. Um, there are several other wonderful student projects I'd be happy to talk more about, but that's just a, a brief sampling. Uh, do do you need to? How are you coordinating with other military? Uh, academic institutions to ensure that all of you are on the same page because you, what you're dealing with is, you know, ethical issues, philosophical issues. Um, it, it can it can veer into you know personal beliefs and religion, uh, which can be very very powerful. You know, we talked to Al Shimkus, uh, you know, about the ethical issues that confront those in the medical community, for mm -hmm. example, in, in treating enemy combatants and, and the lines between patriotism and your obligation as a, as a medical uh, professional. Um, how are you coordinating with you know, the Army War College, the postgraduate school, and other uh, military in, in intellectual institutions so that there's a sort of a more universally accepted view across the military so that you don't have, for example, Navy guys who think perhaps mm -hmm you know, with greater nuance or depth or, or maybe less than their Army or Air Force or Marine uh, compatriots? It's early days still. There's, that, you know, this whole archipelago of different institutions and organizations that are interested in emerging technologies. We haven't seen many who have a formal approach to examining that connection between ethics and technology. We believe that the program here at the Naval War College is the first of its kind among the professional military education institutions. And looking forward, we hope to collaborate with them to a degree. I don't know, use the term the same page, I don't know if there is a page that, that we can all be on since it's such a, a wide-ranging topic with different points of view, but we do need, I think, to collaborate, uh, think together so we can, we can think anew, learn from each other, and find different ways, better ways to educate our students to become these, these critical thinkers. We'll see what develops in terms of our sister institutions. We're also trying to connect with uh, local institutions, uh, colleges in this region. We're in very early stages of maybe collaborating with the Hacking for Defense initiative, where graduate students look at some sort of non-trivial, sticky uh, military problem, and they try to propose a technological solution for it, well, what are, the, what are the ethical considerations involved in that? So we see possibly some growth there as well. In discussions, you know, whether with, with other reporters, but also with military friends, about where the boundaries and the lines lie in all of these ethical considerations, particularly since 9-11, you know, where there are very robust discussions about what was right, what was right at the time, what was wrong in hindsight. Mm -hmm. As students come into your program, what are the nature of these discussions and what's the evolution you see in people who may have come in with certain very set views in the very beginning of, um, you know, it's right, our adversaries are doing it, we're going to do it, and it's, it's you know, and, and that's it. I mean, how do you see people's thinking sort of evolve as they go through the course? What are the big questions that they're asking uh, asking you, asking each other, as they go through this journey of, of learning uh, and exploring something which is very complex and is trying to balance right national interests with personal ethics. I mean, it's a, it's a very complex field, especially for the people for whom this is not a theoretical discussion. They will be the future commanders who will be forced or have to employ the technology. Many of our students hadn't really thought about this much before, and they're busy developing their technical virtuosity and expertise, and that's what, what gets them to the Naval War College. We succeed when we get them to ask different questions and more difficult questions. There was an email exchange with one of our students in the Ethics and Emerging Military Technology program. She's coming towards the end of that program, 
And she was commenting that now, eight months, nine months later into the program, she sees things through not just a different lens, but different lenses. And the questions she asks when she sees somebody on TV or when she reads about some technological capability or some security or strategic issue, now she's asking different questions and she's challenging the received wisdom. That's the point we want to get them to. We have no school solutions. We don't pretend to offer those. We are in the business of not teaching strategy necessarily, but educating strategists and leaders, people who can ask those tough questions and really put others on the spot about their own assumptions, uh, challenge the assumptions that others make as well as their own, and hopefully take their discourse and reasoning up to a higher level. And that is extremely important as these new technical capabilities that our adversaries are developing are foisted upon us. Everybody knows what Vladimir Putin said last fall about whoever controls artificial intelligence will rule the world. You can maybe read into his uh, comments, whatever you like, um, but that gets our students thinking, is this an inevitable thing? Uh, how might we shape it and control it uh, and establish our own norms of how it should and shouldn't be used? That's the art, that's the question, and that's where we need to focus our energy and our resources. Uh, Dr. Tim Schultz, uh, Associate uh, Professor here uh, in, of uh, Ethics and Military Technology. Sir, thanks very much and would, would love to follow up uh, in, on, on following this uh, you know, evolving intellectual conversation. Yes, thank you, a pleasure, and uh, I think we both look forward to seeing how this evolves. It's exciting. So, thank you, Bagra.